Oh, hi folks, so it's James here. Welcome to uh, another edition of the CD Listening Couch. So, just got a few things to show you and talk to you about this afternoon. Um, this week we lost uh, McCoy Tyner. Uh, this is uh, his album, The Real McCoy, on Blue Notes, uh, which came from 1967, uh, the year of uh, Sergeant Pepper. Um, yeah, so McCoy Tyner was um, one quarter of the uh, 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 of the band who played on Coltrane's Love Supreme, and I think he's the last person from that group uh, to pass on. Um, a really amazing, a, a amazing musician. He kind of um, I don't know whether he invented the style of piano playing which. Uh, he was known for. That sounds a bit crazy because nobody really invents a style of, you know, playing an instrument really. But McCoy Tyner seems to have a style which is just all his own. Um, you know, lots of very big extended chords. Uh, he does all this extremely busy, um, fast, florid kind of playing, uh, but also lots of very kind of loud, crashy, bangy harmonies and. Um, you know, he did this thing where he would vamp a lot. He would just play two chords and then just do all this uh, amazingly kind of ornate stuff over the top of it. And um, I don't know whether he got that style, whether he developed that style from an earlier musician, or whether it was just something he came up with. Because one thing that's really interesting, listening to McCoy Tyner, on this record, actually, he plays with Elvin Jones, uh, who is on um, I Love Supreme. And... I've never quite heard a piano and drum duo quite as um, symbiotic as McCoy Tyner and Elvin. It's almost like they're sort of, it's like they're one mind playing together. It's really strange. And the more you listen to it, the more you hear these kind of amazing, you know, either fortuitous or completely calculated moments where they just seem to be just exactly weaving in and out of the spaces which they're creating for themselves. And their phrasing is so kind of locked together, um, it almost becomes one sound or one style. And I was wondering whether maybe, and, and then also, you know, back in the Coltrane band, uh, you had Coltrane's playing, which was also just kind of sheets of sound and this kind of great rolling intensity. And I was wondering, you know, maybe McCoy Tyner's style did just develop just purely because of the people he was playing with. Um, you know, maybe he had to play in that very, uh, in that very rambustious kind of style uh, in order to keep up with the people on the bandstand. Um, but it's certainly he's got his own sound, or you know, he had his own sound, and um, it's. I don't think necessarily he got or gets the credit he deserves because he doesn't seem to have anything like the profile of Thelonious Monk who I suppose was more angular and, and strange, more kind of strange sounding, maybe more of an innovator in some respects with his kind of harmonies. But I mean, McCoy Tyner was just, he was so prodigious. Um, he had that kind of Art Tatum thing where it was just almost like molten lava just, you know, flowing out of him. Um, endless fertility of ideas and just this huge intensity absolutely amazing I saw him live with a trio back in the it would have been the mid noughties I saw him with a trio uh, at the Royal Northern College of Music in Manchester it was great to see him um, I'd seen Elvin Jones maybe the year or two before that at Ronnie Scott's in London so I got to see two of Coltrane's famous band you know in the space of a couple of years is Elvin now this is a great really great album it's a, it's a really good companion piece to um, I love Supreme. It's got Joe Henderson on um, tenor, who's not unlike Coltrane in some respects with his phrasing, but you've got this kind of amazing volcanic Elvin stuff on here, which you can hear it now, you know, it's very, um, it just has a very similar vibe to um, I love Supreme, maybe a bit less devotional, uh, but certainly, you know, kind of in the same ballpark. Anyway, uh, he died this week, he was 81. So uh, I thought I would dig that out. I really like these Blue Note CD, uh, CD re-releases. I've got a fair few of them. It, I mean, it's so hard to find the original albums, but you know, it's quite it's quite nice to collect Blue Note on CD. 
Right, so that's that one done. How far in are we? We're five minutes in. Right, okay. This next one, I wanted to talk about this because um, this is an album which um, I've been listening to quite a lot again recently on CD uh, on um, on the iPod. This is Prefab Sprout and Crimson Red, which came out in 2013 on Kitchenware. And um, oops, today, breaking it. Um, it's one of those nice imitation record CDs. So, um, Prefab Sprout, obviously, they were Paddy McAloon's band from the 80s. Um, they consisted of Paddy McAloon and his brother Martin, uh, the singer Wendy Smith, I believe, and the drummer, what was his name? Neil, Neil Conti. And they put out all these great kind of, I don't know, sort of literary, um, lovelorn, kind of English pop music um, and then Paddy McAloon he developed various health problems and he wasn't able to do the band anymore um, he did keep making records uh, under the prefab Sprout name but the band had basically jumped ship um, you know by this time it really is just himself really and a producer he did do some demos of the songs on this record with his brother Martin but then Martin didn't end up playing on the record uh, because well Paddy McAloon, he developed um, a, a hearing problem um, and some kind of visual problem as well. And so it's a sort of strange combination of medical complaints, which it makes it difficult for him to communicate with musicians in the studio. So he, found, he, he, he finds it easier now just to make music on his own. Uh, and he arranges everything, plays everything. And um, this album is, is a real game of two halves. The songs on this record are absolute prime um, Paddy McAloon, just absolutely wonderful, um, wonderfully composed songs. Um, just, you know, he's got that kind of totally um, ornate harmonic sense where he's able to just, I don't know, just create these wonderful tunes with these gorgeous, uh, <laughs> gorgeous chord changes and progressions. Uh, it sort of reminds you of Burt Bacharach sometimes and um, maybe Steely Dan, you know, just very, very, very adventurous harmonically. Um, also very, very sweet. You sort of need a bit of a sweet tooth uh, to enjoy Prefab Sprout's music, and this album is no exception. But he, he made some very sugar-sweet records in the 90s, I think it was, or maybe going into the early noughties. This one is better. Um, it's got more genuine emotion in there. It's not quite so sickly sweet, but it's, there's some beautiful songs. Uh, th there's a song here, and I'll put it in the playlist down below, The Best Jewel Thief in the World, which is fantastic. And somebody's cut together a, um, a film clip, kind of montage, of a old, I think it's a Cary Grant film uh, about a jewel thief, and it, it works really, really, really well with the song. But it's got a great lyric, fantastic tune. I mean, there's a all the songs on this album are fantastic. There's a beautiful song called The Songs of Danny Galway, which has a bit of a kind of Celtic feel to it. Um, the Devil Came A-Calling, which is a really atmospheric, kind of dark piece. Um, again, with a very um, a very interesting lyric. You know, it's all about this guy who sells his soul to the devil, basically, in order to get, you know, all these things that he wants. Uh, Grief Built the Taj Mahal, which is a very slow and ornate song. Um, it's just a great, it's a great, great set of songs. The only thing that sort of lets it down very slightly is the fact that he doesn't have a band on the record. It does sound good. I mean, the keyboards and the textures are all very, uh, they do have a depth of sound to them. Uh, you can kind of lose yourself in this sort of, you know, ocean of, um, of sound. But there's no drums. It's all, it's all, you know, it's programmed drums and they do sound a bit nasty and a bit clattery at times and it's sort of, it's just a bit, um, you know, it's 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 tempting to imagine how great it would have sounded if you'd have got a drummer in to do it, but like I said, he I think he finds it very difficult to do that now, so you have to just sort of imagine that it sounds just that one stage better than it does uh, without a real drummer, um, but yeah. Truly, truly great set of songs. Not an easy album to track down at a good price. Uh, I looked for a long time to find this. I think I found one eventually on eBay for about, I think it was about maybe £15, £18. So not a cheap album, but one that's definitely worth your time. 
Prefab Sprout and uh, Crimson Red, a Paddy McAloon solo album uh, in all but name. Right, so moving on. Now, uh, in last week's instalment, I talked about um, Orchestra Baobab, who were a West African, um, sort of like a kind of, I don't know, samba, salsery kind of group. And because I was just on the shelf looking at them under O, this record um, poked itself out to me as well. This is um, Opeth, Blackwater Park. Um, and this has been on my iPod for about uh, five years. And I'd not, but I hadn't listened to it for a while. So I went back and checked it out again. And um, I always enjoy it. I discovered Opeth around about the time that I first joined the vinyl community. And it was Derek. Derek Higgins who talked about them and I'd never heard of them before I thought I would check it out um, I bought the record on CD and I listened to it I was going for a big long walk with my son we were going up a mountain in the Lake District and it was a lovely early spring day and it was going to be a long walk it was going to be kind of maybe six hours and he was just walking off ahead you know like he likes to do he doesn't like to be seen with his dad so I listened to the Opeth record on headphones going up this mountain and it was just one of those totally immersive experiences where you're just lost in this kind of soundscape. I didn't know the music at all and it wasn't... The music, it's not my usual kind of vibe or, or thing. You know, I was never into... I was never a goth. I, I, I had friends who were goths back in the 90s and I was part of a sort of scene, I was sort of on the dance scene, you know, the rave scene, and there was a kind of goth contingent, you know, people who wore black and who were very, very into a certain kind of image and a certain kind of mood. And it never really chimed with me. I never really even got into those bands like, you know, the cult and the mission. There was something, I don't know maybe a little bit self-indulgent about it, that never particularly chimed with me. And this record, I sort of, I had to get over a certain level of resistance, because there are some parts of it which do sound a bit like lonely teenage goth in her bedroom, you know, listening to very sort of dark, self-consciously miserable music. But um, there was something about Opeth which transcended that. The death metal vocals came as a bit of a shock to the system. It's not the kind of music that I sort of enjoy, really, but it it, it seemed to work, that kind of really deep, rah, 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 kind of, you know, bestial kind of growls. But then going out in these uh, into these incredibly beautiful lyrical passages where all of a sudden you just get this wonderful passage of piano music or guitar music, you know, acoustic guitar music. I mean, there's some fantastically lyrical passages on this album. Uh, there's a track called Pat, um, Patterns in the Ivy, which is track number seven, and it just starts with this gorgeous, uh, it's kind of acoustic guitar, um, just atmospheric, you know, very lyrical. Um, it's, in, it's really, really uh, autumnal music. Makes you think of just walking through woods where, you know, the leaves have all fallen and... But it's not necessarily pissing it down with rain, you know, it's actually maybe quite a nice sort of pale autumn sky and the sun coming through the orange leaves, you know, it's it's got a very a very reflective kind of air to it. You know, with the piano. But it goes from this, it, you know, it'll go out from this into passages of absolute, just blazing, apocalyptic metal fury. Um, and the music is very, very um, filmic, you know, um, soundtracky. It really evokes really powerful images in your mind of, um, well, all sorts of things. You get, it's almost sort of like Lord of the Rings occasionally. You get these pictures in your mind of these vast landscapes of just burnt out buildings and, you know, war zones and just huge dark fortresses, you know, silhouetted against a kind of black apocalyptic sky and um, it's just very very pictorial I suppose it's quite clever how they do it um, I think what I like about Opeth is that they're not just a metal band it's like they use metal and they use elements of death metal 
as part of uh, a set of ingredients which goes up into making their sound, you know, but they sort of mix it with prog, they mix it with folk, maybe a little bit of psych in some ways, and but not quite psych really, more, more sort of classic prog, you know, they use mellotrons, but the guitar sounds are all really powerful, you know, they've got this amazing bottom end to them, you know, very, very visceral, very dark, um, just a blistering attack, and just great tunes, and I don't know, I just, it just really appealed to me, I wasn't expecting to like it as much as I did, and, um, but yeah, after this I bought another couple um, of records, I bought Damnation, which is a more lyrical set of songs, it's got less of the death metal thing going on, and I bought a couple of albums since, which I need to get into, but um, yeah, Opeth, absolutely fantastic band, you know, if you like prog, if you like metal, um, if you like very atmospheric, soundtracky stuff, all all good, all good, great band. They should be bigger than they are, really. You know, I don't think they're actually all that big, but that's just the way things go nowadays. Bands don't seem to achieve the same level of um, success as they did, you know, back in the day. Right. Okay. I'm going to skip a couple because I don't want this video to be too long. Um, okay. Let's just do this one quickly. This is Jazz by Queen. Um, I listened to this the other evening and I really enjoyed it. This comes from 1978 and it's the album that has um, Don't Stop Me Now on it. It's got Fat Bottom Girls on it and Bicycle Race and a lot of other stuff as well. It's a real mish mishmash of a record, this. It's probably their least impressive sounding album from the 1970s. It's got a rather boxy sound to it. It was produced by Roy Thomas Baker and the band, but they didn't seem to have quite the same quality control as far as the sound went as on previous releases. Um, and it's an example, I think, of a record made by a group who are basically getting fatigued and they're starting to overwork. And they've reached the point where they've, they've sort of climbed this very steep trajectory and they've just reached this plateau and they're really, really famous. But they're probably now just on the verge of burning out. You can sort of hear it in the performances. They don't quite have the same level of intent or the same level of um, sharpness as they had before. There's a slight falling off uh, of intensity on this record. But what I love about it is just you can hear how, um, how much they're still throwing everything into it that they possibly can. One of the reasons I've always loved Queen is the way you can hear each band member just working their balls off in every single song to do something for that song. Because they all used to write individually and they would, and then they would bring the songs to the band and the band would then work on the songs together. But the original songwriter would keep the sole songwriting credit. But despite that, the other members, they just absolutely, they just, they always pull all the stops out in order to give that particular song the best possible uh, chance it can have in the studio of sounding impressive. And that's what I've always loved about Queen just that kind of selfless dedication to making each other's songs just as good as you as they can possibly be and this this album is absolutely full of examples of, of just you know great great drumming from Roger Taylor you know not just the actual parts he played but the actual sounds he came up with you know using special little Chinese symbols or you know just things that will give the music a certain texture and uh, they all do it you know they all just seem to be really trying the best even though the results they sound a bit fatigued uh, and it, it just makes it it just makes it an interesting record I've always thought that the, that the songs on this album they sort of jump around so much it's almost like the songs are not in the right order it's very similar to the impression I get from listening to Back to the Egg by Wings in that the ingredients seem okay but it, it never quite seems to sequence itself so that you've got a sequence of songs which seems to flow. It's always It seems like they just chuck the songs in the air and then pull them out of a hat in order to try and work out you know, a sequence. I mean, the fact that Don't Stop Me Now is the second to last song on the album, that, that, that just seems really weird. You know, Why would you put a song like that second to last? Having said that, there are some great examples of second to last songs on records, and so maybe that was a conscious thing. 
but it seems to just jump around a lot um, you know compared to other Queen albums it doesn't quite have that flow and um, yeah but it's, it's just it's just really enjoyable and it, it's so diverse and just so Queen you know it's just it's got that kind of mad um, diversity I suppose and just that theatricality as well tracks like Dreamers Ball by Brian May which is a sort of old timey kind of song you know they were great at doing those nostalgic type songs you know from the old days you've got rockers on here you've got a couple of really good Roger Taylor songs which are in a kind of um, new wave style more of that jazz and fun it as well where they were trying to you know this was 1979 so they were trying to move with the times and do stuff which was, uh, you know, a bit kind of, a bit in that new wave style, I suppose, um, while still sounding like themselves. I think arguably it's the last, it's the last really sort of interesting Queen album, because after this you've got The Game, which is a great commercial album, it, you know, it's one of the most poppy efforts really, and it, it took their production up a notch, I think, because they started to record with uh, Mac, uh, who was an extremely good engineer, but their sound levelled off a bit, just in terms of it got a smoother commercial sound to it. Well, I think jazz was the last instance of them trying to do something genuinely um, envelope-pushing, I suppose. Anyway, so yes, Queen. That was um, that was hugely enjoyable, as always. Okay, next one. Um, this is Bill Withers, Bill Withers Live. Uh, one of the greatest um, albums, live albums of all time. I think I might just cue it up and give us a break from the grinding uh, emotionalism of Opeth. <clears throat> I was out last night having a meal with some friends and a Bill Withers song came on the restaurant, you know, sound system, whatever you call it, and everybody that I was talking to there knew the song, but they didn't, but they'd not heard of Bill Withers. And, I, you know, I got talking to them about Bill Withers and the fact that he'd been, originally, he had uh, worked as, uh, he used to design toilets for aircraft. That's what he used to do. And then, I'm not sure if he was a singer already or whether he became a singer later, but that was my bit of trivia, you know, about Bill Withers. And I thought it was interesting that people knew the song and they knew some other songs of his as well when I, you know, mentioned them, but they'd never actually heard the name Bill Withers. And um, I think he's an example of just one of those singers who never quite achieved the level of fame that people like Marvin Gaye achieved and Otis Redding. His name is slightly, it falls under the radar, I think. But this is a fantastic live album. It's, um, it was recorded in 1970-something, early 70s, I think. 72, on a rainy night in October uh, in Carnegie Hall. And uh, it's one of those albums that will just keep you company on a long, dark night. Not just because of the music, but because of the linking passages where he talks to the audience. I've never heard a record quite like it in terms of capturing a kind of vibe between the performer and the audience. You know, they're just, they're just absolutely loving him. Everything he says, everything he does, they're just, he's, he's clearly got them on the absolute edge of their seat or in the palm of his hand. You know, he does some raconteur type stuff. He's just he's just got them exactly where he wants them to be, you know, the audience. And there's a great kind of gospel-y fervency to the performances. Really good band. Um, on drums on this record, you've got James Gadsden, who's one of the great all-time kind of R&B drummers. And it sounds like a studio record. You wouldn't think it was a live album. I'm not sure if they touched it up later, but... It's just, it's a fantastic album. It really is. Um, I need to get it on vinyl, really, particularly as this CD is a little bit damaged and it starts to skip towards the end. Um, but yeah, yeah, just great vibes, great musicianship, great songs. You know, his most famous song is on here, which is Ain't No Sunshine. And um, yeah, I think more, more people should know about Bill Withers and uh, this album should be shown a lot more than it is, I think. Bill Withers at Carnegie Hall. Right, so to finish with, um, we've got Robert Plant and Principle of Moments. So recently I've discovered a podcast which 
Robert Plant has been doing, he's looking back over his career and he's talking about all the albums he's made and he's an incredibly eloquent person, um, always very interesting to talk to. And there's a magazine which has come out, what got me back into listening to him, this is an uncut issue of uncut with um, Robert there. He's just brought out a set of, it's a box set of singles um, from his solo years, so it's got me back listening to him again. I've been a fan of Robert Plant since I was about 16 or 17. The first album by him that I ever heard was Now and Zen, um, which I love. This one is the was his second solo album, and it's the album that contains the song Big Log. Um, came out in 1980, not entirely sure, sort of early 80s. Um, Phil Collins on drums. And what I like about the early plant albums is, is the way they take risks you know they're not particularly commercial albums but that he was sort of he was attempting to do something which was contemporary I think he came out of Led Zeppelin and he didn't want to just do the rock god thing he was listening to a lot of 80s music you know things like Ultravox and John Fox and stuff with synths and he knew he had to kind of you know go in that direction but he put a really good band together. There's a guitarist on this record uh, called Robbie Blunt, who is a fantastic musician, you know, really, really, um, just a great, great guitar player. I don't know why his name is not better known. It's interesting in, in rock music or, you know, progressive music, jazz music, you know, certain, music, certain musicians gain a profile. If you take someone like Alan Holdsworth, you know, he's, he's known for being a really hot player. Whereas someone like Robbie Blunt, he's sort of, his name is only known to people, I think, who know Robert Plant's music. And it, it just seems weird to me, because his playing is just, it's fantastic. Um, it's, it's got a kind of um, a very laid-back, lyrical approach to it. It sounds quite African. I think he used African modes and stuff. If you heard his playing on Big Log, it's just got that slightly kind of, well, it's got a very bluesy thing going on, but it's got a kind of African tinge to it as well. And he was very lyrical, and he just did some really interesting guitar playing on Robert's albums. And uh, they only worked together for three albums, I think, uh, and then Robert moved on. Um, Jess Woodruff, as well, was the keyboard player on this record, and he helped Robert to modernise and to come up with a more modern kind of sound. It doesn't all work, I've got to be honest. I mean, Big, Big Log is the towering classic on this record, and the other songs, they sort of struggle a bit to catch up with it. Because Big Log was so memorable and was so, it was such a cool song somehow. The other songs on the record don't have as strong a hook, but they're more sort of mood pieces really, and they're based around musicianship and just the sounds of the instruments and just the, um, I suppose, just the chemistry that the group had managed to forge between them. And uh, it was just, it was just you know, a really big album. I think he went on to do much better records, um, but um, it was an interesting record to come out of the gate with back in whatever date it was. Let's actually get the date of this for you. Uh, this was 19. It's a bit annoying when they won't put dates on records. It always drives me around the twist. I don't know, I'll put it on the screen. It was kind of early 80s anyway, I would estimate 83, 84. Phil Collins on drums, anyway. There's the CD. So, yeah. Plenty. Percy. Principal of Moments. And that's it. That concludes the CD listening couch for this week. Hope you enjoyed it, and uh, thanks for tuning in. If you did, I'll see you all soon. Take care, folks. Bye-bye.